Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. My name is Mr. Dogboat333, and welcome back to Hearts of Iron 4, The New Order, The Ruin as United Kingdom. In the last video, we did a few focuses, but mainly we witnessed people die and suffer. A little bit of upliftedness. A lot of it from people who you don't want to feel uplifted, but what are you going to do? And now, we keep on keeping on. Jack Jones heard the slamming on the barred doors of the mine echoing through the mine. He stroked his rifle and stared down the tunnel entrance. entrance. He was trapped. The only exit was the one that the fascists were breaking down, as he thought. This was the end of the line for him. Thirty years of fighting. Thirty years of fighting for the British workers to be free. And here in a long-forgotten mine in the north of Wales, he would make his final stand. The old Lee Enfield he wielded rose to his shoulder with ease. Also, Browning high power was at his hip, maintained its reassuring weight. The sudden cry of victory from the door brought a macabre grin to his face. The end had come for better or for worse. He'd heard the fascist soldiers storming down the mine, their footfalls echoing in the confined spaces. The first soldier didn't even see the rifle that took his life. The bullet slamming him in the face as he turned the corner right down the sights of Jones's rifle. His corpse fell backwards, collapsing onto the roughly hewn wall behind him, leaving a streak of blood along the wall. The next soldier stumbled across, over the corpse of his friend, the bullet catching him through the neck instead of a chest where Jones had aimed. Four more soldiers died before the one Lee Enfield lay empty. That was enough time for the free fascists to establish covering fire for the rest of her comrades. Jones abandoned his position without a fight and dived behind one of the crates that lay in the cave he'd been hiding in for the past week. While the crate containing the rifles was on the other side of the room, that wasn't what he was looking for. The carefully hoarded grenades were in the crate he crouched behind. Reaching in, he grabbed one and slipped it into his pocket. The first fascist creeping into the room had his head blown off for his trouble. The next two sprayed his position with bullets, but the crate held fast. Jones pulled off three more shots. He threw the now-empty pistol at the next fascist to enter. Before he rose from his crouch and stared at the door, the unpinned grenade clutched in his hand. The last sound to echo through the mine was a red flag at full bore. It shrouded off our martyr dead. Back to speed five now. Oh, we got a lot of events. Now let's do this one. The waves gently lapped at the side of the boat as sunlight began to break through the clouds. It was on the smaller side, only cable able to carry about 20 people at a time, but it served its purpose of ferrying away refugees from Britain. Emma felt the salty tang of the air on her tongue, huddling herself until the blanket draped over her shoulders. Her exit from her home had not been a smooth one. She had been, long, she had been rushed onto the boat in Denonite by old Bill alongside the other passengers, gunfire working in the background. It's possible the old man could have caught another boat, she supposed. Perhaps it would be another day. The child on the other end of the boat began crying, his mother desperately trying to comfort him. Emma didn't know any of their stories, although she had gleaned from the scant conversation that had been made that everyone on the boat was affiliated with resistance in some way or another. A fine lot they must have looked like, bedraggled, bereft, and defeated. If Elizabeth was here, she would have something comforting to say. She would have been chirping about all the possibilities their new life opened up for them. How they could live together away from the burdens of their old one. Or maybe she could have alleviated the bitterly cold sea air by holding her, getting lost in her arms. But that was not to be... Suddenly, a large, dark silhouette could be seen in the distance. Everyone on the boat immediately perked up. As they drew closer, it became clear what the figure was. It was a Statue of Liberty. They had arrived in New York. Mutilation could be heard across the boat. Most were too drained to get too physical. Emma smiled, taking out a wrinkled photo. It was the one they had taken just before the uprising had begun, and they were still hiding in the attic of that old factory. Lizzie's grayscale face smiled back at her, alongside all the other comrades she had knew were no longer with her. Emma held the photo to her chest, whispering softly, We made it, love. I'll do the 
this one. Maxwell and Knight limped through each hallway, followed by the few soldiers left of resistance. The soldier in front of Knight barged through each door as a courtesy for his leader. The former head of MR5 panted harder than he ever had. He recognized the hallways from decades ago, hoping the man in front of him did as well. Both became frantically searched the facility as it quickly became a maze. Where the bloody fuck... Where the fuck was this bloody bunker? His eyes darted across each corridor, still with a limp dragging him down. Where is it? Perhaps I could fly in a supply closet, but surely they would find me, right? He thought again. It's too late to survive them. I just need to outlast them. After getting through a few more doors and dodging the inevitable bullets that rang through each hall, he found it. The supply closet. Knight weaved himself away from the colonel that led him, slamming against the door and desperately gripping the doorknob. He pulled it, it wouldn't budge. He shouted a curse and tried again, pressing against the door as hard as the old knight could. Nothing. Knight shuffled through the bell to the fallen comrade at his feet, trying to find a combat knife. Accidentally scratching his finger on the blade, he scrambled to chop off the hinges. He froze after hearing another gunshot, falling by what sounded like thousands screaming, then more. His panting started to grow faster. Knight turned his attention back to the door. He destroyed the internal workings, but not sleeping, sneaking his way into the room. The screams grew louder, the gunshots grew faster. Minutes passed, now Knight heard boots slamming against the metal floors and Englishmen shouting. Knight could feel sweat dripping off of him. A final solution came into his head. He should kill himself. Yeah, that's the way. He placed his thumb on the back of his pistol and slid it out of the holster. He panted faster. I, I can't. I can't. He threw the weapon across the room, banging against the wall. I've got a better idea. For where all golly jolly good fellows, for where all go jolly good fellows, for where all jolly good fellows. And so says all of us. And so says all of us. And so says all of us. Once more, the singing had echoed through the local pub, although this time it was not the boys who had le just left school causing a ruckus. This time it was men, soldiers who had fought and killed and been through hell for their country. Along the way, they had become brothers. Ben cheerfully clapped Adolf on the soldier as they went Adolf on the shoulder as they went up to the bar. It was a younger man this time. Poor old Michael had been killed in the uprising. Hello there. What can I get you? Yeah, I would like to order two pints. On me, Adolf said. His accent received a slightly odd stare from the barman, but he went ahead and making them drinks without a word. That had happened once or twice with local, other local patrons that night, but neither man had the time or energy to comment on it. As far as Ben was concerned, Adolf was his closest friend and always would be. Taking their drinks, they went back to the crowd of former soldiers. Almost all of them had come from this part of the city, and the newcomers were rapidly getting used to the climate. They were all drinking, talking, and swapping war stories. Ben sat down, joining in, just as Dickie began an antidote of what happened when he stole their officer's cap and wore into battle. Later that night, the mood would grow more somber, as the men remembered their friends who had not made it. You know, Doug, Steve, Martin, Chris. A toast was made to their fallen comrades and to a better future, and in their honor, they got straight back to celebrations. To the winner, Joseph Spoils. Resistance leader Maxwell Knight stood, nailed on to an execution post. The warm blood drained out of his wrist and poured onto the wooden post. His bloodshot eyes glanced back to the door. It opened slightly and the interrogator came in. They both stared at each other for a moment, then looked down to the military baton the interrogator held. Knight was tired of the sunken dance the collaborators put him through. Being a veteran of Great War made you experience things nobody wants to. It was too late, however. He needed one last goodbye, something to truly show the collaborators what they were truly worth. The dirt on the bottom of his shoe. He crafted the perfect lie and stuck with it. The man approached Knight, tightening the grip around his weapon. Do you have anything to say, you cunt? Knight sighed, but the man struck him in the stomach, forcing a, out some blood from his throat. The man shouted at Knight to speak up. Complying responded, his voice in ass. Please. A name. I can give you a name, please. You won't have anything good to say. Ada spilled it out. 
you filthy snake. He rejuvenated his voice after a solid minute of panting. Minute of panting. There's a man. A mole. One of mine. <coughs> his name is Joyce. William Joyce. What? <laughs> Normally when the Prime Minister of the UK and one of the most important cabinet members is the procedure. Nor oh sorry. Normally when meeting the Prime Minister of the UK and one of his most important cabinet members, the procedure was that he would show up promptly, smile and shake their hands, and then sit down and discuss whatever business you had with them in a respectful and courteous manner. The corporate titans of Germany, however, did not seem to believe these words applied to them. Prime Minister, sorry for the delay. We had important business with our eastern operations, said Yo Herman Josef Abs, the only of the Verwirtschaftsführer's leader present, leading a pack of executives from IG Farben, Diamond Benz, Siemens, and Reichsfucker into the room 20 minutes after the meeting was meant to have started. Knowing he had no choice, Nall came simply smiled and welcomed them. The meeting continues for several hours with Butler's economic projections and smooth presentation prompting polite rounds of applause and silent approval from German executives. Now we're doing chaos wars. Just as the initial contracts and offers are being laid out on the tables, however, Ab's silent the entire meeting struck. Just a moment, please, gentlemen. Now, I'm not trying to be un annoying here. Your presentation was brilliant, huh, Butler? Un Britain does look like a great place to invest. He paused for a moment, flashing a wolfish grin at Malkin. But I have one rather major concern that's stopping me from agreeing to all this. Will our previous privileged space in your market continue? As if not, well... There was the previous privileged space and met total mega corporation dominance of the British economy. That's exa what this whole charade had been about all along. The executive's previous nods and words of approval meant nothing compared to the word of OBS. And everyone waited on Nal Kane, what Nal Kane would say next, even though they all knew what it would be. Of course, her abs, you have my word. Well, let's go and. Let's get towards rationing measures. Our supply our su supply of food is low, arguably worse than it was during the Second World War. Rationing is a system that has proven to work effectively even under an international blockade. Therefore, in order to combat the current planning situation, we will dust off the old plans for rationing food and fuel and begin issuing ration books for our citizens. All eyes were on Maxwell Knight. The tension in the courtroom was thick enough that it could be cut with a butter knife. The man who'd orchestrated the uprising just stood there, hands cuffed together, his expression carefully schooled blank. The trial had been entirely for show, as expected. His defiance was paper thin arguments that he had acted according to his own apparent misguided ideals, and that he deserved to live for what he had done. The rest of a trial had been much less fair. Everything from the most inconsequential of lies to the worst of the war crimes committed by the resistance was attributed to him. When those present in the court would discuss what they had seen, they claimed that his expression did not change even slightly as the list of crimes was read aloud to him. Eventually, the time came for him to be called to the stand. Mr. Knight, began the barrister, walking confidently across the floor, your crimes have already been made evident to the jury. Your guilt is self-admitted. Tell me now. That you now that you know what you have done to your country, what do you have to say for yourself? A beat passed, and Knight stroked his chin thoughtfully. The words do not come easily, I must say. What does a condemned man have to say to his condemners? My fate was determined the moment I was captured. But since you are ke so keen to hear what I have to say, and I know that everything I say will be recorded, so I, to the men running this government, I say this. He leaned forward, looking at the prosecutor, dead in the eye. 
I've worked amongst you for years. I know everything about you. Your deepest secrets and your worst nightmares. And I know how utterly venal and blackened your souls are. Each and every one of you Nazi-loving bastards is a traitor to this country. You have failed Britain and her people. And while I may be long dead before your house of cards falls in on itself, that day will come. The former head of MI5 leaned backward in his chair, a vicious smile on his face. Oh, it will come. Burn in hell. He was sentenced to death the next day. I'm innocent! I'm fucking innocent, I tell you! I would never betray his majesty! Please, oh god, don't! I'm not ready! Please, no! No! The sound of a trapdoor opening abruptly silenced William Joyce's screams, echoing all the way to the cell in which Knight was being kept. He smiled grimly. At least one good thing had come of this. Lord Haha -ha was one person that the world would definitely be better at off without. That was for certain. It had only been salient enough to name a few more of those pigs when he was stretched across the rack, but beggars cannot be choosers. His cell door swung open, light flooding into the cell. Two guards stood at the entrance, and Knight knew his time was come. Is it already time, gentlemen? He asked, getting up and allowing them to tie his hands together. Knight supposed it wasn't too late to plan a daring escape. Perhaps he could try and incapacitate the guards before making a break for it. <sighs> but that wasn't his purpose. At this point, and so he instead allowed them to walk him across the courtyard. There was quite the crowd that had gathered. Many faceless, suited men jeered at night as he walked past, and he glanced impassively at them. They would get what was coming to them one day. As he stepped onto the gallows, he couldn't help but reminisce on how he got here. Those early days as a midshipman in the Navy, to the infiltration of the Fascisti, his time at Hennem MI5, the uprising. Failure. Perhaps one day someone would succeed where he had failed. As a noose tied around his neck, Maxwell Knight stared out into his crowd of executors. He breathed and spoke his last words. God save the Queen. It wasn't often Wallop hosted large gatherings in his own estate. Farley Wallop, but tonight was an exception. For tonight, his candidacy for leadership of the BPP would become official. Seated before him were his closest supporters and oldest friends, ministers from the Bedford and Chesterton years, old guard loyals supporting Donville's true heir, and of course his own personal circle of devotees to his own vision for a revitalized England. My lords, ladies, and dear friends, said Lord. Portsmouth, tapping the side of his glass with a knife and standing up to address the room as waiters collected their now empty plates. This evening, we embark upon a quest of the highest significance. We raise a shield to defend our beloved England from the machinations of enemies and the dangerously misguided beliefs of some within our party. He paused before making eye contact with Chesterton and Bedford before continuing, both with clear approval on their faces, with the memory of our martyred Prime Minister moving our hearts. And loyalty to the crown and country, invigorating our spirits, we shall march to war. We shall defeat them in Parliament. We shall defeat them in the party. And our prize will be Downing Street once more. My lords and ladies, my campaign for, le campaign for leadership of the BPP has begun. A loud cheer filled the room as all present erupted into great applause. Their joy preserved even longer by their prompt arrival of a vast array of desserts and delicacies from the kitchen. Looking around and seeing the combined influence of all the men and women in this room, Walt couldn't help but feel confidence surging within his bones. He was going to win this. However, the opposite end of the table was an argument breaking out between Chesterton and Gardner. Walls mercifully ended by the quick diversion of Bedford onto more mutually agreeable topics, a dispute lingered in Walt's mind, posing an unanswered question to him. If he won, what would his Britain look like? Well, we'll have to find that out next time. Well, maybe not next time, but we can't find that out in this video. Um, thanks so much for watching, gang. Like, like, just like if you did, leave any comments, feedback down in the comment section below. I read all the comments good. Appreciate all feedback my have from me. Check out my various links on the box below. And sub the notification bell to keep up to date with all the uploads. And yeah, that's it for now, my friends. I thank you all for watching. 
and I will see you all next time. Bye-bye.